Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Warner. I'm the founder of Mixergy, where I interview entrepreneurs about how they built their businesses. And these businesses are changing the way that people live their lives. But here's one part of our lives that hasn't changed much, not since uh, Craigslist was introduced years ago. Renting apartments. I've got to be honest with you, for most of my life, until my wife and I uh, moved here to San Francisco, for most of my life, the apartments I lived in looked pretty much the same. Brand new Brand new now furniture, brand new kitchen, brand new bathroom, same layout almost, uh, different amenities. Almost all of them would have an office that you can go in and work uh, from. Some would have uh, gyms and not, but outside of those small little differences, they were pretty much the freaking same. And the process for getting them was the same too. I'd have to go on Craigslist. I'd have to go and schedule an appointment with the rental person. I'd have to go and take a walkthrough. I'd have to see what they were willing to show me and what they weren't. And it's such a drag. When meanwhile, you want to buy a car? Buy a car. Own a car. You basically see it online. You do nothing but go in and inspect it. When I wanted to get our car, I saw everything I needed online. I had a full understanding of it. And then I took a drive into Oakland to pick up the one that I liked. Super freaking simple. But renting an apartment for $2,000 um, that exa- is exactly the same from Washington, D.C. to Manhattan to Southern California, all exactly the same. Frustrating. Well, today's guest saw a similar experience and he said, you know what? I think I can improve it. It's a marketplace, yeah, which is tough. It's dealing with landlords, which really are a breed to themselves, you know, and they aren't especially eager to try new software or new things. But um, he found a way to do it. And I invited him here to talk about how he did it and how the company is growing. His name is Anthemos G- uh, wait, Georgiadis. How did I do with the last name? That was it. I meant hey, Andrew. You know what, Anthemos, when I just looked at the spelling of the name, I was able to pronounce your name no problem. But as we were talking, I wrote it out phonetically. Now I'm going through every phonetic. Uh, Anthemos Georgiadis, he is the co-founder of Zumper. It's a house and apartment rental platform. We're going to talk about how he built his business thanks to two sponsors. The first will help you get your site, your logo, your anything designed beautifully. I've got to tell you about my latest experience with them. It's still ongoing. It's called Design Crowd. And the second is a company that will help you hire your next great developer. And uh, for us, we're going to think hire a CFO through them. But I'll tell you more about them later. For now, they're called Top Tal. But let's get into the interview. And Thamos, good to have you here. Yeah, good to be here. Thank you for having me. So you're a guy who actually had this idea going back when you were in school. What was the issue that made you come up with this idea? Yeah. How um, did you experience think, it? Yeah, it was the classic kind of undergrad problem where you've lived, you know, with your parents or in university accommodation for a long time. And then you hit 20, your college kicks you out and tells you to fend for yourself in your second year. And it's the first time you're in the big bad world and you have to actually go and find your own apartment to rent. And I think the key insight for me was that search was a pain, as you said at the beginning, like search sucked. And this was in the UK, but it's no different in the US. But um, actually, the core problem is what happened after search, which was for me, getting a a property manager could have traded my offer against like a bunch of other people. There was like no transparency. They got the price to be bid up like another 20 percent. And then at the end of the process, kind of finding out that. Actually, the other people we were bidding up against were our friends, but this kind of property manager had all the information and was just trading everyone off against each other. And so I think the key problem was for the biggest expense of your life as a renter, how can it be that, like you said, there's no transparent mechanism like buying a car or ordering an Uber now where you could just tap and actually transact in a very transparent way? And so this was a problem I saw 10 years ago and kind of five years ago, I actually thought this was the time to go to solve it. Why didn't you do anything? Well, I guess you were an undergrad, so you couldn't really devote the time to it. Is that what it was? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that changed for me was the advent of like native mobile applications. This Why? Back- Why does native change it? Yeah, just because if you think about real estate, like, you know, some of the big players in the space, like Zillow on the for sale side, it's great that they have mobile apps, but you're still transacting on paper in an old school way. I think with Zumper, what's so exciting is the transactions really happen in the field. Like renters are applying for apartments on refrigerators and on walls in open houses. And this is where like mobile can really change the game and build a real transaction engine on site in real time. And so with the advent of mobile in like kind of 2011, when apps on Android and iOS were becoming very common, I think that's where it was a no brainer that like this was the time to do it. You're saying that if you had to go back in time, be older, have the time to do it, have the money, 
you couldn't have really built this business if it was desktop laptop based because real estate brokers wouldn't have carried laptops with them. People wouldn't have been able to go back after looking at an apartment to their homes and apply. It just adds too much, uh, 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 too much friction. Is that right? I think it would have, I, so no, I think you're right. I think we probably could have pulled it off. You could probably have developed like a decent responsive mobile web app uh, instead. Um, but I think the, the advent of native is, it's, it's proven across various verticals to be a higher converter than like any web product. And so I think that was like the occasion. I think I had like personal reasons pretty why I wasn't ready to start a company kind of back then. I think uh, I went off into like, BCG. You went to the Boston Consulting Group, is that right? I did. Right. Yeah, I why? Was why did you? Why is a guy who has all this entrepreneurial spirit in him? Why did you say, you know, I'm going to go and take a traditional job? You're asking why I sold out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I actually don't think it's sold out. I I happen to believe that starting out in management consulting and in related businesses gives you an overview of industries and allows you to think more maturely than if you jump right into entrepreneurship, which is what I did. So I'm not yep. putting it down at all, but I do want to understand why. What what drove you to that? Yeah, no, and I agree. I uh, so I was like a classics major. I studied like Latin and Greek, so I was like no shoo-in for like an entrepreneur. I think I had the the, the drive where I saw this problem that I was desperate to fix, but I didn't feel like I had the tools to actually go and do it at the beginning. So BCG for me was like an ass kicking for three years of like a, a basically a lesson bottom up in economics. Like how do big companies run themselves? Like what, what, how do you build margins? Like how do you build teams? How do you build culture? And I mean, I worked as I'm sure you did and many of your viewers have in, in these industries where you work 20 hours a day, for three years, you really get your ass kicked. You were working look. 20 hour days. Pretty More much, so yeah. than you do now at Zumper. Yeah, it was, I mean, Zumper, yeah, it's funny. So Zumper's like, I think there's more like stress and anxiety in terms of because you care so much. Uh, but I think we're more efficient at Zumper in like how we build and like we don't have a bazillion meetings. Whereas at BCG, it's client services. You're kind of consulting the CEOs of like really big companies. And yeah, you're kind of like, you're having meetings at 3 a.m. to edit like the footnotes and PowerPoint and it's, it's an amazing training, but I think a lot of people that go through that, as I think you know too, could have take that and apply it to actually getting shit done elsewhere. All right. So other than the fact that they really got you to work hard and push yourself to the limit, what's one thing that you learned about running a bigger business that you didn't know in school that's helping you now run your own company? Take me through one thing that you learned so that I don't have to go through the 20-hour days to understand it. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's a, a couple of things. I think on the downside of consulting, like what I learned by looking at some of our big clients was how kind of crazy and efficient they were. So there were some clients we had where you'd walk around and they had like 20,000 people in HQ. But really, like if, if they had half the number of people, but they were really focused, I think you, they would have actually been more productive. So I think the biggest lesson I learned at BCG was actually like focus in organizations. It's such a boring term, but it is so critical because the bigger an organizational gets, the more it can become unfocused because there's so many different kind of crazy ideas you can do. And so actually I think the best clients we had at BCG were the most focused. So there were CEOs who opened meetings by saying, hey guys, like there are 16 things our competitors are doing, but like there's one or two things we're excellent at doing and that's what we're going to do. And I think they were the best CEOs and I think they're also the best CEOs in tech as well. I see. And the benefit of being a Boston Consulting Group is that you are taken into their business. You see their problems. They're very open with you about it because that's why they hired you, right? And they trust you. They show you their numbers. They show you their people. You get to analyze them. They take your opinion seriously. So you're forced to think clearly about what you think this business should do, much more so than a business case study that they have in, in uh, business classes. I see. Okay, so you went through all that, you got it, and then at some point you said, hey, you know what? This idea that I had years ago, I think it's time for me to take it on now as a business. What drove you? What was that motivating moment that made you say, let's become an entrepreneur today? Yeah, I think it was, in, uh, so I moved to the US, I, I went to business school on the East Coast, and I've had the same experience through renting. And I think there was just a moment where I realized that it had been kind of five, six years since I'd originally had the idea. And I was like, I think I assumed at some point it would be sold. Someone's going to see the world as I think I see it. And this inevitable conclusion that if you built the apartment rental industry bottom up today, it would look like a bit like the college application industry where there's like a common app and it applies to the vast majority of colleges in the same way 
if you and I built the apartment rental industry today, there would be a common app. It would apply to every single apartment. And so once you were pre-qualified, you knew that you could apply for these and you didn't quite have the income to apply for these. It's so obvious. And you could get towards the concept of a book button. And so you know what? The honest answer was during business school, while my friends were taking hedge fund jobs, I just thought it is, I'll be so mad if someone else pulled this idea off because I have such a clear idea of like how it should look. And that was it. It was basically this like just belief, delusional or not at the time, that I could see where the industry would be in 10 years and I wanted to go and like achieve it in five to six years. And so it just became impossible to consider any other job out of business school. And so I kind of ignored it. That's kind of a big risk though because you've paid for business school. One of the big things that you're paying tens of thousands of dollars for is to get that diploma and then the job options that you get from that. And you are just trashing all that and saying, screw it. I'm going to go and start a business. Yeah, my, my parents and I had that discussion <laughs> during business school. And uh, yeah, it was hard. My, during the, I, my program is a two-year program at HBS. And my peers Harvard were Business School. I was at Harvard Business School. So why, I see. we? So now you're really giving up opportunities. Did you just quit or did you pause your school? <laughs> no. I, raised, I finished the job. I, uh, in my second year, I stacked all of my classes to the first two days of the week and I uh, raised the first million dollars for some for, during my second year. So Did I it really help for up. you to be a, a BG, BCG, Boston Consulting Group grad, essentially, or alumni, I guess is what they call them, and at the same time be a Harvard Business School student? Did that help you raise money or was that insignificant? Yes, it was interesting. So I think it's absolutely, uh, it was m- mostly insignificant for being, I think, a successful entrepreneur. So like, how did you raise a million of- dollars with nothing but an idea? So I think that's where it comes in. I think it's insignificant. To be, uh, to be like a great CEO. I think you can just have the DNA to be like a resilient, great CEO. But I think where, where business school did help and where BCG did help is when you go into these VCs for the first time, you know, we've now raised $39 million in total. But to begin with, we raised one. And we raised one on like six months of really kind of basic data from some tests we've done in San Francisco. That's where like having a network really helped because some of the, the, the MBAs who've gone into the Valley were working at Kleiner or Andreessen, like two of the first investors we had in the company. And so the MBA really helped me get kind of warm intros to these funds, which is like the best way in. But actually kind of in the five years since, like, yes, I learned a ton of BCG and HBS, but really like a lot of the best entrepreneurs didn't have either of those brands or like any formal training, but they just had the resilience and the grind. Where did like, you raise money like, from? I'm, I'm looking at right now on AngelList, Crunch Fund, Okay, that's uh, the TechCrunch guy who I don't think is running it anymore, right? Andreessen Horowitz, Kleiner Perkins, Greylock Partners, just some of the people who are investing in the business. So you raised, you said, 1.7, at least that's what they're saying here on the site? Yeah, seed, yeah. The and it's just seat. you going door to door. Did you have yeah. any connections to them other than the ones that you made through school? No, yeah, just kind of alums. Uh, we were we started pitching on the East Coast because I was based in Boston to begin with. We're now in San Francisco. I mean, we were blown out of the East Coast. Uh, we had no success in the early days on the East Coast with venture funds there because I think they, there's a higher bar. I think you need a little more like revenue and traction. Whereas on the West Coast, we took kind of a six-month product trial for could renters book apartments from their phones. And the overwhelming showed that renters would love to do that. And the West Coast funds, I think, were much more willing to bet on the product. And so... It was a bunch of no's, and then when you get the first yes, the other five or six yeses came very quickly. So it was kind of like, you know, like if you get an Andreessen or a Kleiner in, the other yeses are who's much. Who's the first person who gave you the yes that brought everyone uh, else in? Kleiner. So Kleiner. Kleiner. How'd you get Kleiner to come in and say yes? Yeah, we just painted a vision of like where the industry should be in five years and then showed them a tiny amount of data we generated from a tiny beta test in San Francisco that kind of showed that consumers were down for this. And so we said, if we have the consumers and we have the product, the industry has to move with us. Now it's real estate. It will take time. But um, they backed the vision and they backed some really early data that showed 35 leases. We closed in San Francisco where we'd represent. You already had that. We had that. We, but it was really like thrown together over a summer. We had I see. So it wasn't that you're walking in with just an idea on paper. You also had gone in and I'm looking at my notes here. You had a crappy site, as you told our producer where <laughs> renters can book a lease right on their phone and you had 30 apartments in San Francisco that were willing to list with you. That's it. I um, see. So, and we, so it was yeah, like an the, MVP and a, not a proven so, model. How did you get the renters? I understand getting the, the apartments. You're telling them, look, I'll bring you highly qualified people. They're going to be in the door ready to buy and you're going after these more professional operations, not the mom and yep. pop, right? How did, you get the, how did you get the renters to pay attention to you? 
Oh, yeah, so totally. So in this MVP, I mean, you basically chicken and egg, you have no landlords to start, no renters. So obviously most supply, supply demand markets will start on supply. How can you get the landlords on? And so we would get the landlords on, syndicate their listings. So we were syndicating at the time to Zillow, Trulia, Hotpad. So you could have faked your own demand by creating partnerships with other people. And so they, they think this is unput, but actually in the short term, a lot of the leads were coming from other sites that we'd syndicated to, where the other sites were cool because they wanted the listing. And then Zumper would run the second part of the process, which was actually the booking mechanism. And that strategy of like kind of faking demand until you have it, it's something we used for the first two years of Zumper. So the first two years, we syndicated all of our small landlords' listings out to other sites, brought the demand back in, and there was this tiny extra point that it also went onto this new site called Zumper. And then after two years, Zumper started being the largest lead generator, and that's when you can move away from the other sites. But see. my goodness, it took a long time. I kind of did that with my interviews. I No one wanted to do interviews on Mixergy. They never heard of it, but I would say, look, I'm going to do this interview and post it on this bigger site. Yep. And by the way, it'll also be on Mixergy. They said, well, I don't care about the by the way. I heard the bigger <laughs> site, right? I get how you're doing that, but for you, these landlords would have been listed on Zillow already. They would have been listed, wouldn't they, on all these other places? So aren't you doubling up on what they already were able to do? So there's a couple of things in the early days that we did that was different. There was no one-stop shop tool that would just send you out with one tap from your mobile phone to like all of these sites. So we built that. And then also in the very early days, which which we finally come back to now, we were testing the concept of book. So for the first you know six months, all we did was say to landlords, hey, the leads will come in from whatever sites you currently get them from, but we're trying to build an orderly process for the application system. So a renter can literally pull out their iPhone in an open house, hit apply or hit book, and we'll show them a clearing system where we'll actually like efficiently show renters in a hot market kind of where their application lies, which is you know typically what happens. Were you able to do that with this, what you call crappy site? Exactly. You were. We were doing that. And we were I doing see. So you were telling them really openly, we're going to take your listing and we're going to put it on these other sites. I know you're doing yeah. it already, but we'll do it on your behalf, right? Yeah. Okay. And in addition, we're going to allow people to apply using this one application process. Yeah. And as a result, you're going to get faster applications and they're going to be organized and this will make it easier for you to book. Faster I see. Faster applications, better qualified renters, and we'll kind of use kind of data to inform which renter you should take. Exactly. And this is just you working the phone in Boston like, hey... I, I know I'm not in town, or I guess you don't. It doesn't matter whether you're in town or not. You're working the phones. You're calling up these these real estate. Uh, I guess it would be uh, um, landlords. We work with landlords directly. The landlord. Yeah. You did work with landlords. Yep, directly with landlords, and and I flew out. So my co-founder and I met. He was in San Francisco um, when I flew out in between my two years of grad school, and we tested it like maniacs for like uh, two months. We just worked twenty four seven for two months to try and get enough data, and then that was to your question earlier. Yeah, that was enough. No revenue, just 35 leases, but a really compelling story of how big this is as an industry and like how big the vision was. And that was enough for the first money through the door. Um, I've got to read you this one sentence from TechCrunch's article about the launch. The last two, <laughs> the last two words just got me. The initial seed round was used to build out Zumper's engineering team and build a few as-yet-launched products that George, uh, George Addis... Sorry about that. Labeled as, quote, highly disruptive. If this thing didn't work out, this line of highly disruptive I, would have been such a laugh line in the future. But it did. I'm on your site right now on the, the right monitor of my computer. I see a beautiful building. I see all the screenshots that I want, including, oh, this building has a, a pool table as one of the amenities. I've never been in a building that had that. But it also has the gym and all the other stuff that I'm used to. And what it has that... I always wanted is freaking floor chart. Show me where it is. They're basically like three different layouts that these professional operations have. I want to see which one am I getting. And I see, and it's all in there. And that's the way the word that the site works. It took a while to get to this. Let me talk about my sponsor's product for a moment. And then we're going to come back to how you went from this guy with a highly disruptive idea and a crappy site in your own words to a guy with a beautifully polished site that collects leads in a way that I thought was really interesting as I was using uh, the site. My first sponsor is a company called Design Crowd. Have you ever heard of Design Crowd? It's totally fine. Uh, yes, haven't. I haven't used them, but I've heard of them. But you've yeah. heard of them, right? For a long yeah. time, I didn't use them either. And to be honest with you, I even accepted their ads knowing that they were good because people had used them, but I didn't use them myself because I'm intimidated by design because I feel like it's going to be so much work to tell people what I like and what I don't like. And then I used them and my ads just suddenly changed. I became effusive. I became just like this loving person because it took me just a few minutes 
one evening to just fill out a form saying I need new cover art for my podcast, etc. Well, I recently used them again this past Friday. And what I needed was a logo for my bot program, which teach people how to create chatbots. One that says, this is a, a bot academy certified professional because the certified professionals wanted something they could put on their site. I went to their site in five, maybe 10 minutes. I was able to say, here's what I want. Here's what I don't want. What I want is use my logo. What I don't want is for you to invent a new logo for me. What I want is for you to have these words on it, certified professional. What I don't want is you to have excess co uh, content on there. I got over a hundred different designs within three freaking days. And each one of them, actually, in this case, not all of them were good. Some of them actually invented a brand new logo for my company, which I didn't like. So I went in and I gave them feedback. I rated them one or two stars if they invented a new logo for me. I rated them one or two stars if they didn't highlight that it was a certified professional because I wanted it to, to be clear. And the ones that were good, I gave them feedback and told them how to improve. I also, be honest with you, I gave my username and password to one of our certified professionals. I said, look, this is supposed to be on your site. Can you go in and give, give them feedback? And so she went in and she gave them feedback too. And now we're getting better and better designs because all we have to do is say what we like, what we don't like. Her, um, approach was slightly different from mine. I was being a little too nice. So I would say, here's what I love about your design. It's this and this and this. And by the way, can you make this small change? I said, Andrew, just be more freaking direct with them. That's how you get better results. So she just went in and she said, I don't like this because of this reason. Adjust it. I don't like that because of this reason. Adjust it. All this for $200. I'm getting a hundred plus designs so far. I think I'm going to get 300 designs as, as things go. If you're out there and you need anything designed, a logo, uh, an infographic, a t-shirt, a web design, a brochure, a business card, and anything at all, really, I urge you to go to Design Crowd. What you're going to do is just fill out a quick brief. It won't take long. And you're going to have opinions because their questions are good at, at listening your opinions. Then you say how many people you want to, to give you designs. You could be showered with hundreds of designs the way that I am. You then give feedback. They will improve. You give more feedback. They will improve. And then you only pick and pay for the design that you love. And you could continue to work with that designer forever if you want. This is such a freaking good company. I love them, as you can see. I've been impacted by them every day. My cover art looks like something I'm proud of, where before my, my podcast cover art looked like ass. I urge you guys to go and take any design issue that you have to Design Crowd. Go to this special URL, and you're going to get a big discount. That's a URL that I use, by the way, to get a big discount from them. It is designcrowd.com slash Mixergy. I saved a hundred bucks on my custom design. Designcrowd.com slash Mixergy. I freaking love them so much. I'm going to make out with them. That's how good they are. But you can see the design right there. If you go to that URL, you'll see what they did for me. Designcrowd.com slash Mixergy. So you now, coming back to this story, um, they did not have to pay extra for me to say that I would make out with their, with their company. <laughs> That's just, uh, <laughs> that's just how I really feel. So you finally get this extra money. What do you do? What's the first thing you spend money on? Uh, once we raise money. Yeah. We, we spent the first two years just building supply. So before we got to our first hundred thousand, why even, supply? You've got a marketplace. Why not say I'm going to get as many different renters as possible. Then the guys who have off, uh, who have real estate to offer will come and list it. Why'd you go after one? Yeah, no, totally. It's just like, kind of, uh, it was a, it was a guess. Uh, it was just intuition early on that, if you, if you could build the best brand, do a bunch of really cool content marketing, but ultimately in rentals, this huge FOMO, a renter has gigantic fear of missing out because it's such a big transaction. And so if you don't have 90 to 95% of the listings in the market, you're toast. And so we had to focus on supply side first. So the first two years before Series A, we just built out a really great supply side distribution of landlords. And our Series A, which Kleiner led, was entirely based on, okay, we had tiny user adoption there. I think we had like 50,000 users a month on the consumer side. It was super small. And we said, all right, now we've got supply baked out with various strategies. We're going to spend the next two years building millions of monthly uniques on top of that supply. And that's the, the series of story that could have ended up working out. I see. And so you didn't need supply, meaning you didn't need renters, because the first couple of years, what you were doing was just syndicating the, the apartments that you had to other people's sites anyway. So that's how you were able to kind of balance out your market. You had the, this real estate um, and you got your uh, renters by posting on other places. Is that right? Yeah, you've got to basically say, how do we fake demand? Like, how do we create demand before we have it? Because we were like, we just want as many landlords as possible. And I think when we raised, 
We'd grown from zero to 30,000 landlords using our small uh, landlord tool called Zump Pro. Um, and yeah, we were like, right, great. It needs to be a one-stop shop. The only place they can do kind of marketing, their listings, tenant screening, and we'll bring in all the demand into the CRM. And so, yeah, that's right. Uh, we basically uh, had various strategies, whether it was pricing advice or syndication or tenant screening, um, to basically build the first ever one-stop shop for a small landlord. And then Zumper being one of the sites, like you said with your podcast, on day zero it was irrelevant. On you know day 365 it was kind of relevant, but then two years in it was like super relevant. So we didn't then have to syndicate to the other guys. I see. And what what I'm trying to understand in my notes here, you guys, you talked to our pre-interviewer and you said that um, when you show the price, people, renters, think that there's an auction. And I don't understand that. It seems like that was something that you, that you did that didn't work out. But I'm seeing the price on your site right now. What did you mean right. by that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, the first four years of the site, we, we ended up, and all the apps, we just built a really large search audience that now you know, has 5 million users a month. But now with Zumper Select, which is the new end-to-end -end product that we launched in Q2 this year, goes back to our origins, which is like, how can we create the book button for a 12-month apartment lease? And in the early days, in those 35 leases we discussed um, before we raised our seed round, we tested everything. And one of the crazier ideas we tested was, hey, renters never have transparency. What happens if you showed renters not only that they could edit the offer they made. So say an apartment in San Francisco at the time is listed at $3,000 a month. Not only could the renter edit the price and they could offer less, but we'd also show renters what the other um, applicants had offered. And so it was a, a really well-intended thing to bring transparency for the first time. But you can imagine um, if a renter sees what other renters have offered, it implicitly created an auction, which was like the opposite of what we were trying to do. So it was a really interesting lesson that we learned earlier. So now we've gone full circle and coming back to book. It's not going to really show what other people have offered, but it will kind of show you if you hit book, because we're representing the landlord, where you stand in order, if there have been applicants before you, if there are applicants afterwards, where you are in processing. I see. I see. So what you were doing, I didn't realize that people were basically making an offer. I thought if I go and, and rent from a landlord, I'm just paying whatever he's offering, whatever he's asking for or moving on. You're saying some people offer more money? Yeah, there's, there's some people offer more in hot markets and just as importantly, some people offer less in, in markets where there isn't such crazy demand. Like oh, I didn't Samsung. realize that was going on. Yeah, and so the multifamily are typically less malleable. You know, the big tower buildings with 150 units plus, their price is pretty much their price. That's what like I was there. renting from, I see. But you're saying mom and pop, you can negotiate, got it. It's more malleable, and some like when you buy a house, like and sometimes the price is like an opening uh, gambit. And so we we want to renters to feel very encouraged that if they uh, felt it wasn't worth what it was advertised at, they could offer less. And often the landlord still took it. And then in some cases that backfired, not not necessarily for the landlord, but for the renter that we had inadvertently created an auction where if the renters were bidding above the price, they would uh, they would bid up on each other and that was kind of not what we were trying why? to create. Why wasn't so was that a good thing? Why isn't creating a bidding process, an open one, a good thing? Yeah, so I think it's, um, I think that's obviously for a landlord, a lot of landlords kind of like that because it, it kind of set market price for them. I think it didn't really solve the problem we were trying to solve that like, we want to get a renter a fair market price as transparently and as easily as possible with no paperwork and just with a book button. And so I think the best way to do that is to give the landlord, when they post the listing, the best possible comps to know what the fair market price is. And then instead of creating the rent as a malleable field that can go up, um, actually, as long as we priced it right, we feel like a renter who books that on Zump Select now, they get, like a, they get the fair price and they get to close instantly instead of applying and waiting seven days to close. I see. You applied for uh, TechCrunch Disrupt. Why? Why does being in TechCrunch Disrupt matter at all? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, it's, um, I think it has some of the halo effect that a YC demo day does without having had to go through YC. So um, I think what was nice about TechCrunch is we, we already, it wasn't like YC where we went in and had to develop the idea. I think we'd been working on the idea for a year. And so what we really wanted was the kind of that event where it was like, let's launch and get a ton of press on day zero and see what we can do with it. And so TechCrunch was perfect where 
they had a huge event, like 5,000 people in the audience. I think they had like 50,000 people live streaming at our launch, uh, which was genuinely terrifying. I've never done anything as scary again in my life. And um, just what a wild ride. Like first day, you just get huge traffic spike, like 20,000 people on your website and your apps the first, first day. Next day, it's like 10,000. You're like, okay, like they still remember us. And then like day three is like the pit of despair where you like have under 1,000 users and you realize that you haven't yet built a product that's sticky and it's really kind of humbling to, to come down from that roller coaster so it was the the highest of the highs and like three days later it was the lowest of the lows when everyone's forgotten you and moved on to the next big thing so um it was it was to get our name out it helped with fundraising um but in in retrospect it, we didn't sustain any of the momentum we got it was just the first ever foray into the press and getting our name out there Okay. What about, do you do any conferences for landlords for the real estate industry at all? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a really big conference called NAA. Uh, that's the, the large kind of multifamily landlord conference uh, that we go to every year. We, we've spoken at a few of them. Um, we, we, whereas we want to build the first ever brand for renters, because I don't think anyone's really built a renter-focused brand. Everyone's always focused on where the money comes from, which is the landlords or the brokers it's still like critical that we don't just build a crazy product that works for consumers that landlords despise. And so, yeah, we're, we're really tightly knit with both the multifamily landlords, the big guys, but also the, the long tail mom and pop landlords who really actually control the majority of listings. And uh, we kind of meet both of them at these landlord conferences. So, so far we've just talked about a guy who's gone from height to height. Everything just worked out, but it wasn't like that. Around the seed stage, you were flying back to San Francisco you were reading online about one of your competitors. What did you see and how did that influence what you were thinking? Yeah, I mean, as every entrepreneur listening to this knows, like it's never a linear growth curve. Like you just go through such ups and downs and your job as the CEO is just to kind of keep the trend uh, pointing up. Um, I think the lowest point in the early days was, as I mentioned, we had all this early data and then we said to the investors after we raised the seed round, great, we're going to come back to the concept of book first we're going to build lead gen to get to millions of monthly uniques and that took like three and a half years to get there and so the downside of doing that was we paused on the really disruptive idea like you mentioned before which was like book which was how can you take every intermediary out and like go direct and create a book button and so what we were scared of the whole time is crap what happens if someone does this first or we're doing all this like semi like clever stuff to like build liquidity so I just spoke at a conference in Boston. I was about to fly back. I was absolutely exhausted. I was getting onto a flight with no Wi-Fi. And just before takeoff, I read a TechCrunch article that one of our competitors had built something that sounded a lot like what we were trying to build. And that's, as you know, everyone's had every idea before. It's all about execution. So we weren't. I wasn't pissed that like someone had stolen an idea or anything. I was just pissed that someone was executing in that direction faster. And so, you know, the phone's off turbulent flight from Boston to San Francisco in the middle of the night and all you can think about is um, what on earth are you going to talk to your team about when you go and see them the next day like how are you going to pick morale up like are we doing the right thing waiting this long and that was like there were various moments like that but that was a really low moment where we had really no traction yet on the land or the renter side we were pretty nine months into the company what's the name of the company that was coming out it was a company that was older than us called Lovely uh, they ended up uh I don't, it's They're not big in San Francisco. Are they gone now? Love yeah, Dot Lee, from they, what I remember. They were bought, I think, uh, a couple of years ago by Rentpath, and then I don't think the team stayed. It's kind of run as just a, a search website now. But I think they originally had had a very similar vision to us, and they'd be going for two or three years before we'd even launched. So we were playing catch up from day one. And I always reminded my team that we were the young guys, we had to execute like crazy people. And they seem to get towards our vision like before we took the stride, even though we've maybe done a bit more um, beta testing of it. Anyway, so it, in the end, like if they didn't end up executing against it, like we're, we're the only people in our in the residential rental space doing end to end. So it kind of worked out. They, what night, happened? Why didn't it work? And, and actually, they are still in business. I do remember I did use them because they have what you guys have, which is good search. They kind of you guys bought Padmapper, am I right? That's right. Yeah. Love those Pad, they yep. kind of like Padmapper just created a, a nice experience for seeing the same listings that were everywhere available everywhere else. Why didn't it work for them? Do you think the ability to just go on a website and buy? 
or rent, excuse me? Uh, I, so I don't know. Um, never, they never really got that much further than that instance. I, I suspect it's because um, you really have to have deep landlord penetration to do this because you can't just stick. So, for example, if someone went to Zumpa uh, in New York, you'll see Zumpa select kind of on like one in five listings. Um, the four out of five listings that don't have it are landlords or property managers or brokers that we're not working with on select. But on one in five, it has it because we have really deep relationships and like contacts in the industry. And so it's kind of the boring biz dev piece, but it's actually essential that you can't just add a book button on top of all of your listings because the, the landlord will be like, who the hell are you guys? Or like, hey, I didn't sign up for this. I just wanted a, an email message from Andrew saying I'm interested in coming to the open house. But for a subset of our listings that we've been working on for five years now, they're all in on the end to end model. They want higher quality renters overnight. They don't want to wait. They want some kind of rent guarantee. And so um, I think we have the best shot of pulling this off because we have really deep relationships on the landlord side and that we're bringing the industry with us to do this, to do this. not just saying, you're all idiots. Like, you don't understand millennials. Like, this is how it's going to work um, because that, that will never work. And like, these guys are smart on the landlord side. They understand it. If you explain it to them, it just, it just takes time since it's a very new concept. Our producer told me that you were trying not to show anxiety or worry when you saw that the competitors were coming out with this thing that you had envisioned. How did you stop? How did you stop yourself from getting distracted by that, from losing faith, from over worry and stay focused on creating your product? What did you, what's your technique for doing that? Yeah. Um, it, and I learned it the hard way. The first year I moved to Silicon Valley, it's like so glitzy. There's all these like tech crunch articles and like all these, all these blog, blog posts about like your competitors. And you like, you read them all. And then you kind of realize, uh, honestly, like when our numbers weren't moving fast enough, you couldn't realize that like none of that stuff matters. Like if our numbers aren't moving, there's no way what Zillow is doing is going to affect us going from 50,000 uniques to a million uniques. It's, it's so small in the early days that like you're crazy you think you have competition from like other players it was it was actually just from a lack of focus they're like we just need to execute and be really introspective and so in terms of like how i deal with it the truth is is like just like ridiculous transparency with the team like at the time our team were five people six people just coming back the next day and being like you probably read this it doesn't matter guys like we're just going to execute better than anyone like it doesn't matter that we think we had the idea first or someone else had the idea first like it's just about execution. And so I think it's like really hard as a founder or CEO to look your team in the eye and be like, yep, not great news. Like I'm aware of it, but it doesn't matter guys. Like let's just focus on the roadmap and on our metrics. And like every Monday let's review all the data. And that's all that matters. As long and as if someone correct. says, but look, they're going to, they're going to build this thing out. People are going to eventually yep. buy on their platform. We're fools for not building this now or, or even months ago. How do you respond to that? What do you say to when someone's skeptical? Yeah. And they, and like, and people, people would bring that up. And yeah. Probably two or three companies at the time we were nervous around. You just, you just got to remind them it's, it's of why we all agreed on it in the, in the beginning. And it was never just like, hey, I'm, I'm the CEO. This is what we're going to do. As a founding team, you've got to be super tight and make decisions together. Just like guys, it's you've got to be patient with this. Like the strategy, smart. Like our investors back it. It's, it's not as sexy as launching all this stuff overnight. But actually, like. Launching a half baked isn't going to work, okay. and you know what? And I was wrong. I told the team it would take us two years to come back to the book. It took four. So like we're we're here sitting after four and a half. Well, actually, we just crossed five years old, and now we're doing it. But we're doing it to like an audience, how many visitors a month? Where like we already have all the demand, and now we're bringing in the supply to go end to end. And now it's just like so much easier. But like I was wrong. I told my team it would take two years, and I think they believed me, and I believed it. It took five, but all those people are still here and they're all ready to like finish the job. So I think it's like leadership. It's the, at the end of the day, you, you solicit opinions, you kind of make decisions together, but your team have to look at you and believe that you're right. Um, and even if it turns out you're right, but it took a bit longer, that, that you're, you're someone they can get behind. And that, that's hard. And I'd never yeah. run a startup before and you grow. And the gravitas grows as you kind of make risky decisions, but if they pay off, it makes the next one easier. All right. I'm going to talk about my second sponsor and then come back into this. So I actually had dinner with uh, Dylan from TopTal. TopTal is this company that helps uh, companies hire great developers. Just last night we had dinner and I said, so are the ads working for you? 
And he says, yeah, we're, I said, you're profitable based on the number of people who come to the site, say that they came to you from Mixergy. He said, yeah. I said, great. So what are you doing now? He goes, well, I'm trying to evaluate how many people are buying from Mixergy, even though they're not telling us that they're from Mixergy, because we know we get some kind of a brand lift. I said, how are you doing it? He says, well, there's a company that will track how much traffic's coming to the site. And then based on when the podcast goes live, how much extra traffic's coming in and where, what's the likelihood that some of it's coming from Mixergy? I said, dude, it's already profitable. Why are you, why are you going through all this work? And he looked at me like I was crazy. Like I was maybe slow witted or something. And he said, because that's who I am. That's what I do. I, I want to understand fully how effective this ad is. It's not enough for me to know that it's working. I said, why? And as we talked, he said, well, I didn't think it through fully, but you can understand the value of it because maybe we want to buy more ads for Mixergy than we already are. If we understand how much more value you're delivering, we could buy more ads. Or maybe there are other podcasters who aren't leading people to use their discount code properly and we're not going to buy ads from them because we think they're failures because we're not fully anticipating how much revenue we're getting. We want to understand that's the way we operate here at TopTal. And I realize, ah, that's why they hired him. These maniacs at TopTal love to hire people who are maniacs for detail like this, who when they're having drinks with someone can't just stop and say it works. They have to say, I want to understand this full problem and I want to figure it out better than it needs to be figured out. And that's the magic of TopTal. So if you guys are out there and you're looking to hire developers and you're trying to understand why TopTal's people think differently and work differently than the average developer, what the difference is between the best developers and the regular developers, you can see it through everybody who works at TopTal. And so I urge you to go check out this special URL where I will get credit, but now they're going to find out how, like, if you don't use a URL, how, uh, how many people are coming for me. But here's a URL that if you go and hire a developer from them, they're going to give you 80 hours of top tal developer credit when you pay for your first 80 hours in addition to a no risk trial period of up to two weeks. It's top is in top of your head, tal is in talent. Go to top tal.com slash Mixergy. And I've heard forever you can hire great developers from them. I've heard now for a long time that you could hire great designers from them. I've known for, for long enough that I could also hire MBAs from them. It didn't occur to me until last night at dinner that maybe this is where I can find my part-time CFO. Someone to just look over my numbers and tell me, am I missing something? Am I overpaying? And so they've got uh, finance people now and I plan to hire one from them. Go do it too. Go check out the company that I've used already and will continue to use. It's called TopTal. Check them out at toptal.com slash Mixergy. Also, like you, an Andreessen Horowitz backed company. These guys at Andreessen Horowitz, they're very selective. They're good. Okay, so what took so long? You thought two years. It ended up being four years. This magical moment that back in school, in high school, you wanted to create. Why did it take so long to create it? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, market, two, two answers are pretty. One, I think marketplace is super difficult. Um, when you build marketplace liquidity where you have the demand and you have the supply, once you have it, it's really beautiful because it's incredibly hard to lose that. But to get there is a pain. So I think one is like marketplace versus if I start another company tomorrow with you and say we did like a furniture startup, we want to build a marketplace for furniture. I still think it would take us like three to four years, maybe we shave off a year, maybe two to three years to get to the marketplace liquidity. Just really hard to build supply first and layer demand. It takes a long time. But why not just create it on like you did before for a handful of customers who could then put your tool on their websites. And when someone goes to their site to rent, they could uh, just press a button oh, yeah. and rent. We've Why- been doing that. Even that took a while. Just figuring out like, what the one-stop shop is for someone, you know, selling furniture. What is the features they want? How do you get the big guys? How do you get the mom and pop? How do you get someone in the middle who owns a couple of stores in the Richmond district? So it's just like mapping the industry. Um, so I think, first of all, marketplace is a uh, difficult until you get to liquidity. The second one was um, kind of like beautiful, but like it took time. Is I had no experience in the real estate industry, so I, I came at the problem with like beautiful naivety from like just having a problem. Like every time I rented, it sucked, and it wasn't search that sucked, although it was partly search. But it was the second part, which is actually how do you get to like close the lease? And so part of the reason it took time is we. We built bottom up. So we're like, okay, let's redesign the industry bottom up with no experience of having ever really worked in it. And so that takes time as well because you make mistakes and you make assumptions that just for various reasons. You believe in transparency. Be transparent. What's one big mistake that you made because you came to this industry so naive? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I, think, I think one of the ones was um, we thought book, same concept. We thought book was a SaaS tool originally. So we're like, let's just build it and we'll give it away to brokers, landlords, property managers, and they'll just use it and they'll change their behavior overnight. But you remember that a, a, a small property manager, they have no, they're, they're not trying to fix the problem for the renter. A small property manager, and it's, it's such an obvious conclusion, but it takes a while to figure it out. Their client is the landlord. They're, they're trying to grow their business by growing more landlords. So they don't care if a renter has a crappy experience. They sorry, that's that's partly no. Not I true. get it, right? That's it's not. Maybe they don't. They're not completely immune to it, but it's not the pressing problem for them. They're not building a renter brand. So our tool, which began as a SaaS tool, the, it's such a like looking back on it, such a naive assumption we made that was incorrect. Is that if you build it, they will come and they will change their behavior overnight because of a software tool. Whereas now, the way I look at it, if I knew what I knew now. Four years ago, the way I'd look at it now would be like, no, this has to be more like Uber. Like, we have to go completely vertically integrated on a subset of our inventory. And we have to help the renter at search. We have to help the renter at tour booking. And we have to help the renter at booking. And the only way to do that really at scale is that you're representing the landlord directly. And you're, you're actually interacting with the renter the whole way through. So the renter never comes out of some brand from A through Z. Um, that was like a pretty obvious conclusion and actually at the same time we were launching you know uber and lyft were getting going and it was kind of like at the time it was like wow like that seemed quite aggressive to go full stack whereas now looking back on it so obvious that like to really drive a high nps and high consumer satisfaction in our industry you also kind of have to go full stack that's the biggest mistake we made from our naivety on the way in yeah, you know what? I kind of think that everyone is like me. They're willing to just try new software, figure out if it improves their business, and they're constantly on the hunt for new software. No, that's not the way they think. Yeah, no, it's this. And real estate's conservative. If you look at like the verticals on the internet, even fintechs moved forward like in the last 10 years. I think like there's loads of great ways to invest now. But like real estate, as you mentioned in your openers, barely changed. And it's because it's, it's owned and controlled by very kind of old school, like historic parties who've owned these buildings for like a century plus and it's slow to change. So I think that was a, a big thing we got wrong is uh, you can just kind of give it to them and it'll change. It, it won't. I'm learning about your past by seeing what your internet archive shows about how the site <laughs> looked over the years. And one thing that I saw you emphasize a lot was the the credit report, the instant credit report, your partnership with the credit agencies, with one of the credit agencies, uh, Experian. Talk about how how that came about and what what importance that played. Yeah, so um, it, it's really critical to everything we do in kind of two phases. So to begin with, it was actually uh, it was to test the assumption of like, can we get pre qualified renters? So in the in the core model before select launch, which is the end to end model. A renter can actually pre-qualify themselves by running credit, criminal, and eviction, either from their iPhone or Android or from web through Zumper. And um, it's it's like the most sophisticated uh, data pull on a renter's kind of credit and rent worthiness that anyone's ever built. And so in the self-serve way, we allow landlords to request it from renters or renters to proactively submit it to landlords. And so you can kind of guess, but kind of like faking what we were going to come to eventually in the self-serve world of like having renters do this in open houses on their own and like apply and then watching the landlord pick it up and, and say, you've got it. And so now in the second phase, we're using exactly the same API calls, the same integrations, the same native first approach to build it for ourselves. Where like we build this prequel on a renter, it becomes part of their common app. And then it applies for basically the majority of listings on select next year. will all accept this common app. Uh, so, so that's why it was kind of central to both phases of the company wondering how you get customers that I hate to say it, but I didn't know about Zumper. I, I, I knew about uh, PadMapper because people complained yep. about them, but I've looked for <laughs> real estate here. I didn't know you guys existed. What do you do to get people to come to your site? Yeah, no. And like we're, we're still growing. Like we have a lot, we have millions of users a month uh, just on Zumper, even outside of PadMapper. So I, actually, I don't see that. Uh, when I look at your, um, so your similar web numbers? Oh no, I see it. Okay, so two point two million monthly visitors. I see it now. Okay, yeah. So how do you? So both Zumper and Pam Apple have about uh, yeah two million uh, monthly visitors on web, and then we also with huge adoption on native. So to answer the question of yeah, great, great question. 
how the hell do people find us? Because we don't spend a lot right. of money. Um, yeah, so Pam Mapper, part of the acquisition was like, they're the best known brand of under 25. They're like past through college generation, so we love them. They're, they're a huge part of our, our vision for the future. On Zumper, a huge part of it's been native mobile. So if you went to the app store uh, under like find a rental on lifestyle, Zump is the number one recommended app by Apple and Pam app is the number two recommended app by Apple. Oh. And so, um, and then on Android, we're kind of editor's choice, which means we're kind of up there, uh, kind of featured pretty high. So we've always built early products for Apple and Google, whether it was like Apple Watch or Google Wear and some of the new things that are actually being announced this week uh, by Apple. So um, between native SEO, branded awareness, and ultimately content marketing, which has been like a really good hack for us to get like widespread distribution uh, without spending money in terms of like doing rent price kind of infographics and stuff, we're just 90% of our distribution is organic and we're just trying to like grow as fast as humanly possible. What do you mean? How, what is the organic uh, traffic sources? I see things like, I've never heard of this company, but trovit.com so homes.trovit.com and send you guys traffic what's that so we have some referral traffic which i think that one is but the majority of organic traffic is um uh, it's either seo just trying to come to the first page of like apartments for rent in san francisco queries or it's the the, the native stuff where it's, we're not paying native installs it's like how do we build a brand where they either go to the app store and just type zumper which is how a lot of people find zumper or where apple have actually vouched for zumper and said if you're looking to move Actually, the top two apps are Zumper and Pam Mapper, and that, that's been like really great for us as well. Um, yeah, I saw over the years, I don't have it up in front of me right now, but I saw over the years what you guys were doing with some kind of report. That seemed to help, right? Yeah, so that's pretty the, uh, the single best marketing um, kind of tip we found, which was we sit on a bunch of rental data, and no one was publishing their rental data, and yet journalists love it. It's kind of like food porn or like rent price porn. And so we were really the first people to ever start publishing infographics four years ago on like rent trends and how markets were trending. And so in like 50% of the times you read a New York Times article or, or another article about a rent trend in New York or in, in the US, they'll be using our data. And we found content marketing like a really good way to like get the brand out, but without shouting about the brand. We're not saying, hey, Zump is amazing. You have to use us. It's more like hey, we're trying to become and have become like an expert on rent prices and rentals in our industry in the US. Here's the data. And then we don't say anything more, which I think is like a, a good subtle marketing tactic where you're not shouting about how amazing you are. You just give the data. You're an authority. Yeah, exactly. I see it right now. So I'm looking at um, an article that was written a few months ago, New York's one bedroom rents drop and... Ba 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 ba. The information is from website zumper.com. And I see. So now that's the way that people are discovering you guys too. Yeah. And we have it. It's not like we have a massive team doing this. We have like two people who spend part of their role as kind of cutting the data and, and then kind of working with journalists on like how to present it. But it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's been fantastic. And because our data is really like second to none, it's super clean. We take out duplication. Uh, journalists also really trust it. Uh, I'm trying to think of one other thing that I saw that you guys were doing. You know what? The app. You mentioned earlier that whatever Apple announces, you guys incorporate in your app. I freaking love my Apple Watch. Nobody else cares about it. Amazon got rid of their Apple Watch app. Google got rid of their app. I, I like the Amazon. I didn't love Google Maps. I, I don't know. I'm still surprised they took it out. I'm even more shocked. You keep yours. It's still up. Why? <laughs> are people using this? Is this or is this just your your new marketing? We are whatever they launch, we do. And if you're someone who's looking to experiment with apps, you're going to come and try our app just because of whatever Apple launched. I mean, yeah, Apple and, and the Play Store from Google, they, they build a made amazing new tech. And some of it is going to work um, like well, and some of it's going to work amazingly well. And you obviously you, you're making the same bet they are when you develop with them that like you're going to help them try and make it amazing and so with the watch it's not a majority of our users but for engaged users who want real-time notifications they want to know if that apartment over there just became available and there are people who are and they want it on their watch and your watch yep. will tell you if the if i'm walking down the street it will say the apartment right over yep. here is available yep that's right and like if you think about real estate in a competitive market it's actually kind of helpful to have that now it is not the majority of our users but the Apple Watch, and actually also the Google Wear integrations were good. They're, they're, it's, they're for the renters in market right now, actively looking. Real-time notifications with 
whatever medium you receive them through are actually really good. So so we we really enjoyed the watch integration and there's some cool stuff this week we'll be announcing with Apple around some of the, the new stuff they announced uh, last week. I'm excited to see it. I love my freaking watch. Um, all right. You know what? This is kind of outside of what we of your business, but I'm curious about the X fund. This these are investors in your business, right? The the two co founders I think were arguing. They got into this legal dispute. One was trying to take the investments away from the other. How did that Im- impact you? Yeah, so uh, we were aware of it. I think they uh, they dealt with it really well in terms of the the portfolio companies. As far as I know, like they were, it was always very above board. They let us know kind of what was going on. Um, I knew both of the people um, as investors and uh, personally, and so it was a really, really hard situation for, for both of them. And uh, yeah, we 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 just focused on execution. And we didn't, and that's it. And we they, they told you what's going on. They say they're arguing. Did they settle it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we really did just like <laughs> put our heads down and focus on execution. It, was, it really didn't involve us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's like always sad to see that when it happens, and I feel for both of them. And uh, no, we we where we weren't involved, and we just kind of had heads down. Okay, all right. Uh, the thing that I mentioned earlier about how you guys are good at lead gen uh, or collecting information, I brought it up. I'll say it now uh, because I didn't get into detail about it earlier. The interesting thing is, I find an apartment on your site on Zumper. When I want to see availability, you immediately say, well, who are you? Give me your name and email address. I give you a name and email address, and then I'm basically logged into the site from then on, and I get to see the floor plans and everything else, which is such a marketing technique. And I feel like, is there something else like that that's helped you guys build your collection of, uh, of renters? Is there something else like that that I'm missing because I'm not knee deep in your, in your, um, uh, in your site that helps you guys grow? Yeah, I think actually um, the the two things that are really going to help us grow in the next year that have helped now is a unique content and then a really unique value prop. So unique content, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of small landlords who just post to us now since we kind of don't work with other partners. So in markets like um, LA, for example, and like Santa Monica, some of the charming buildings are like the small mom and pop stuff and like you really can only find that stuff on Zumper or Pamapa. So that's one reason that people do come to us. Um, the other one, the other one is really Zump Select. Like the search, just to put it bluntly, doesn't really fix the renters' problem. And like I think all the public companies in our space are fixing that problem, and it's great, and they'll do just fine and make a ton of money. But like no rent is going to come away, from, as you were just saying, saying oh, I sent ten messages to ten landlords. God, I love like Zillow or you know or the other sites. I think it's fine, but it doesn't really solve the carnal problem we're trying to solve. So. The feedback we have on Select right now, which is the end-to-end product, where we, you only interact with Zumper until the very moment you lease, we track NPS, Net Promoter Score, as a, as a proxy for like how successful that business is. And when we yes. when we saw Redfin go public, Redfin went public with a 50 NPS, which is really good. And I think most lead gen sites are much, much lower, maybe in the 10s or 20s of NPS. Zumper Select is currently an NPS of 82. Now, that won't continue. It's far too high. It's based on hundreds of transactions. So it's not on the low end. It, it's on a decent uh, wide base. But it turns out that this is a problem for renters. And if you solve it, the net promoter score is super high. And I think it's even higher than like... And this is for um, people who've actually rented, not just sampled it. This is transactional NPS. So there's people that have gone through. So the equivalent would be uh, if you're buying a car, like you mentioned earlier, if you went through the whole process, uh, actually a lot of car buying NPS is still really crappy because people hate the experience and feel like they're being lied to. So this is this is like transactional NPS that you've got to the end of the funnel. We measure kind of CSAT through the funnel and like how you're doing kind of through the thing. But we, in the short term, as we launch, the most important thing is if we did take you end to end, we want you to feel that you felt the love and you got a great deal from us. And um, it's a really good indicator that we're onto something. And now we just need to move as fast as humanly possible before someone else comes in. So, so we're we're just heads down um, executing really quickly right now. All right. Well, the site's looking great. I can understand how people. Um, I think a specific kind of person is especially eager to just rent online. Um, and I know that up until like I got married, that would definitely have been me. Even after we got married, that was me. Um, I'm excited to see what you're going to be doing with uh, Zumper Select. The website for anyone who's listening is Zumper. Um, I didn't even get to bring up how you said, look, I'm much more risk, risk averse than other entrepreneurs. There's some entrepreneurs who are born entrepreneurial. I happen not to have been that, you said. But there's some people 
who are born entrepreneurs and others who just find a really ridiculous problem that they have to fix. You said that is you and I could see it and I could see you fixing it and it's exciting to see how much uh, you've done. I'm looking forward to finding out more. Guys, check out Zumper.com, Z-U-M-P-E-R.com and of course my two sponsors, the company that's now designing my new logo for my uh, graduates. It's called Design Crowd. Check them out at designcrowd.com slash Mixergy. And a company that we have hired a developer from, a designer from, and soon a CFO from. Great for hiring part-time, full-time, whatever. Check them out at toptal.com slash Mixergy. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. You bet. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Erica. Bye. Hey. Yeah, thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 